Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution by Michael J. Behe, narrated by Mark William. Preface A Molecular Phenomenon It is commonplace, almost banal, to say that science has made great strides in understanding nature. The laws of physics are now so well understood that space probes fly unerringly to photograph worlds billions of miles from Earth. Computers, telephones, electric lights, and untold other examples testify to the mastery of science and technology over the forces of nature. Vaccines and high-yield crops have stayed the ancient enemies of mankind, disease, and hunger, at least in parts of the world. Almost weekly, Announcements of discoveries in molecular biology encourage the hope of cures for genetic diseases and more. Yet understanding how something works is not the same as understanding how it came to be. For example, the motions of the planets in the solar system can be predicted with tremendous accuracy. However, the origin of the solar system, the question of how the sun, planets, and their moons formed in the first place, is still controversial. Science may eventually solve the riddle. Still, the point remains that understanding the origin of something is different from understanding its day-to-day -day workings. Science's mastery of nature has led many people to presume that it can, indeed must, also explain the origin of nature and life. Darwin's proposal that life can be explained by natural selection acting on variation has been overwhelmingly accepted in educated circles for more than a century, even though the basic mechanisms of life remained utterly mysterious until several decades ago. Modern science has learned that, ultimately, life is a molecular phenomenon. All organisms are made of molecules that act as the nuts and bolts, gears and pulleys of biological systems. Certainly there are complex biological features, such as the circulation of blood, that emerge at higher levels. But the gritty details of life are the province of biomolecules. Therefore, the science of biochemistry, which studies those molecules, has as its mission the exploration of the very foundation of life. Since the mid-1950s, biochemistry has painstakingly elucidated the workings of life at the molecular level. Darwin was ignorant of the reason for variation within a species, one of the requirements of his theory, but biochemistry has identified the molecular basis for it. Nineteenth-century science could not even guess at the mechanism of vision, immunity, or movement, but modern biochemistry has identified the molecules that allow those and other functions. It was once expected that the basis of life would be exceedingly simple, that expectation has been smashed. Vision, motion, and other biological functions have proven to be no less sophisticated than television cameras and automobiles. Science has made enormous progress in understanding how the chemistry of life works, but the elegance and complexity of biological systems at the molecular level have paralyzed science's attempt to explain their origins. There has been virtually no attempt to account for the origin of specific, complex biomolecular systems, much less any progress. Many scientists have gamely asserted that explanations are already in hand, or will be sooner or later, but no support for such assertions can be found in the professional science literature. More importantly, there are compelling reasons, based on the structure of the systems themselves, to think that a Darwinian explanation for the mechanisms of life will forever prove elusive. Evolution is a flexible word. It can be used by one person to mean something as simple as change over time, or by another person to mean the descent of all life forms from a common ancestor, leaving the mechanism of change unspecified. In its full-throated biological sense, however, Evolution means a process whereby life arose from non-living matter and subsequently developed entirely by natural means. That is the sense that Darwin gave to the word and the meaning that it holds in the scientific community. And that is the sense in which I use the word evolution 
throughout this book. Epilogia for Details Several years ago, Santa Claus gave my oldest son a plastic tricycle for Christmas. Ultimately, busy man that he is, Santa had no time to take it out of the box and assemble it before heading off. The task fell to Dad. I took the parts out of the box, unfolded the assembly instructions, and sighed. There were six pages of detailed instructions. Line up the eight different types of screws, insert two one-and-a-half-inch screws through the handle into the shaft, stick the shaft through the square hole in the body of the bike, and so on. I didn't want to even read the instructions, because I knew they couldn't be skimmed like a newspaper. The whole purpose is in the details. But I rolled up my sleeves, opened a can of beer, and set to work. After several hours, the tricycle was assembled. In the process, I had indeed read every single instruction in the booklet several times to drill them into my head and performed the exact actions that the instructions required. My aversion to instructions seems to be widespread. Although most households own a video cassette recorder, VCR, most folks cannot program them. These technological wonders come with complete operating instructions, but the very thought of tediously studying each sentence of the booklet makes most people delegate the job to the nearest ten-year-old. Unfortunately, much of biochemistry is like an instruction booklet, in the sense that the importance is in the details. A student of biochemistry who merely skims through a biochemistry textbook is virtually certain to spend much of the next exam staring at the ceiling as drops of sweat trickle down his or her forehead. Skimming the textbook does not prepare a student for questions such as outline in detail the mechanism for hydrolysis of a peptide bond by trypsin, paying special attention to the role of transition state binding energy. Although there are broad principles of biochemistry that help a mortal comprehend the general picture of the chemistry of life, broad principles only take you so far. A degree in engineering does not substitute for the tricycle instruction booklet, nor does it directly help you to program your VCR. Many people, unfortunately, are all too aware of the pickiness of biochemistry. People who suffer with sickle cell anemia, enduring much pain in their shortened lives, know the importance of the little detail that changed one out of 146 amino acid residues in one out of the tens of thousands of proteins in their body. The parents of children who die of Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis, or who suffer from diabetes or hemophilia, know more than they want to about the importance of biochemical details. So, as a writer who wants people to read my work, I face a dilemma. People hate to read details, yet the story of the impact of biochemistry on evolutionary theory rests solely in the details. Therefore, I have to write the kind of book people don't like to read in order to persuade them of the ideas that push me to write. Nonetheless, complexity must be experienced to be appreciated. So, gentle listener, I beg your patience. There are going to be a lot of details in this book. The book is divided into three parts. Part one gives some background and explains why evolution must now be argued at the molecular level the domain of the science of biochemistry. This portion is largely free from technical details, although some do creep in during a discussion of the eye. Part 2 contains the example chapters, where most of the complexity is found. Part 3 is a non-technical discussion of the implications of biochemistry's discoveries. So, the hard stuff is confined mostly to Part 2. In that section, however, I liberally use analogies to familiar everyday objects to get the ideas across, and even in that section, detailed descriptions of biochemical systems are minimized. Some listeners may plow right through Part 2. Others, however, may wish to skim the section or even skip parts, then return when they're ready to absorb more. For those who want a deeper understanding of biochemistry, I have included an appendix outlining some general biochemical principles. I encourage those who want all the details to borrow an introductory biochemistry text from the library. Part 1. The Box 
is opened. Chapter 1. Lilliputian Biology The Limits of an Idea This book is about an idea, Darwinian evolution, that is being pushed to its limits by discoveries in biochemistry. Biochemistry is the study of the very basis of life, the molecules that make up cells and tissues that catalyze the chemical reactions of digestion, photosynthesis, immunity, and more. The astonishing progress made by biochemistry since the mid-1950s is a monumental tribute to science's power to understand the world. It has brought many practical benefits in medicine and agriculture. We may have to pay a price, though, for our knowledge. When foundations are unearthed, the structures that rest on them are shaken. Sometimes they collapse. When sciences such as physics finally uncovered their foundations, old ways of understanding the world had to be tossed out, extensively revised, or restricted to a limited part of nature. Will this happen to the theory of evolution by natural selection? Like many great ideas, Darwin's is elegantly simple. He observed that there is variation in all species. Some members are bigger, some smaller, some faster, some lighter in color, and so forth. He reasoned that since limited food supplies could not support all organisms that are born, the ones whose chance variation gave them an advantage in the struggle for life would tend to survive and reproduce, outcompeting the less favored ones. If the variation were inherited, then the characteristics of the species would change over time. Over great periods, great changes might occur. For more than a century, most scientists have thought that virtually all of life, or at least all of its most interesting features, resulted from natural selection working on random variation. Darwin's idea has been used to explain finch beaks and horse hooves, moth coloration and insect slaves, and the distribution of life around the globe and through the ages. The theory has even been stretched by some scientists to interpret human behavior, why desperate people commit suicide, why teenagers have babies out of wedlock, why some groups do better on intelligence tests than other groups, and why religious missionaries forego marriage and children. There is nothing, no organ or idea, no sense or thought, that has not been the subject of evolutionary rumination. Almost a century and a half after Darwin proposed his theory, evolutionary biology has had much success in accounting for patterns of life we see around us. To many, its triumph seems complete. But the real work of life does not happen at the level of the whole animal or organ, the most important parts of living things are too small to be seen. Life is lived in the details, and it is molecules that handle life's details. Darwin's idea might explain horse hooves, but can it explain life's foundation? Shortly after 1950, science advanced to the point where it could determine the shapes and properties of a few of the molecules that make up living organisms. Slowly, painstakingly, the structures of more and more biological molecules were elucidated, and the way they work inferred from countless experiments. The cumulative results show with piercing clarity that life is based on machines, machines made of molecules. Molecular machines haul cargo from one place in the cell to another along highways made of other molecules, while still others act as cables, ropes, and pulleys to hold the cell in shape. Machines turn cellular switches on and off, sometimes killing the cell or causing it to grow. Solar-powered machines capture the energy of photons and store it in chemicals. Electrical machines allow current to flow through nerves. Manufacturing machines build other molecular machines, as well as themselves. Cells swim using machines, copy themselves with machinery, ingest food with machinery. In short, Highly sophisticated molecular machines control every cellular process. Thus, the details of life are finely calibrated, and the machinery of life enormously complex. Can all of life be fit into Darwin's theory of evolution? Because the popular media likes to publish exciting stories, and because some scientists enjoy speculating about how far their discoveries might go, 
it has been difficult for the public to separate fact from conjecture. To find the real evidence, you have to dig into the journals and books published by the scientific community itself. The scientific literature reports experiments firsthand, and the reports are generally free of the flights of fancy that make their way into the spin-offs that follow. But as I will note later, if you search the scientific literature on evolution, and if you focus your search on the question of how molecular machines, the basis of life, developed, you find an eerie and complete silence. The complexity of life's foundation has paralyzed science's attempt to account for it. Molecular machines raise an as-yet impenetrable barrier to Darwinism's universal reach. To find out why, in this book I will examine several fascinating molecular machines, then ask whether they can ever be explained by random mutation or natural selection. Evolution is a controversial topic, so it is necessary to address a few basic questions at the beginning of the book. Many people think that questioning Darwinian evolution must be equivalent to espousing creationism. As commonly understood, creationism involves belief in an earth formed only about 10,000 years ago, an interpretation of the Bible that is still very popular. For the record, I have no reason to doubt that the universe is the billions of years old that physicists say it is. Further, I find the idea of common descent, that all organisms share a common ancestor, fairly convincing, and have no particular reason to doubt it. I greatly respect the work of my colleagues who study the development and behavior of organisms within an evolutionary framework, and I think that evolutionary biologists have contributed enormously to our understanding of the world. Although Darwin's mechanism, natural selection working on variation, might explain many things, however, I do not believe it explains molecular life. I also do not think it surprising that the new science of the very small might change the way we view the less small. A Very Brief History of Biology when things are going smoothly in our lives, most of us tend to think that the society we live in is natural, and that our ideas about the world are self-evidently true. It's hard to imagine how other people in other times and places lived as they did, or why they believed the things they did. During periods of upheaval, however, when apparently solid verities are questioned, it can seem as if nothing in the world makes sense. During those times, history can remind us that the search for reliable knowledge is a long, difficult process that has not yet reached an end. In order to develop a perspective from which we can view the idea of Darwinian evolution, over the next few pages I will very briefly outline the history of biology. In a way, this history has been a chain of black boxes. As one is opened, another is revealed. Black box is a whimsical term for a device that does something, but whose inner workings are mysterious, sometimes because the workings can't be seen, and sometimes because they just aren't comprehensible. Computers are a good example of a black box. Most of us use these marvelous machines without the vaguest idea of how they work, processing words or plotting graphs or playing games in contented ignorance of what is going on underneath the outer case. Even if we were to remove the cover, though, few of us could make heads or tails of the jumble of pieces inside. There is no simple, observable connection between the parts of the computer and the things that it does. Imagine that a computer with a long-lasting battery was transported back in time a thousand years to King Arthur's court, how would people of that era react to a computer in action? Most would be in awe, but with luck someone might want to understand the thing. Someone might notice that letters appeared on the screen as he or she touched the keys. Some combinations of letters, corresponding to computer commands, might make the screen change. After a while, many commands would be figured out. Our medieval Englishmen might believe they had unlocked the secrets of the computer. But eventually somebody would remove the cover and gaze on the computer's inner workings. Suddenly, the theory of how a computer works would be revealed as profoundly naive. The black box that had been slowly decoded 
would have exposed another black box. In ancient times, all of biology was a black box, because no one understood on even the broadest level how living things worked. The ancients who gaped at a plant or animal and wondered just how the thing worked were in the presence of unfathomable technology. They were truly in the dark. The earliest biological investigations began in the only way they could, with the naked eye. A number of books from about 400 B.C., attributed to Hippocrates, the father of medicine, describe the symptoms of some common diseases and attribute sickness to diet and other physical causes rather than to the work of the gods. Although the writings were a beginning, the ancients were still lost when it came to the composition of living things. They believed that all matter was made up of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Living bodies were thought to be made of four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, and all disease supposedly arose from an excess of one of the humors. The greatest biologist of the Greeks was also their greatest philosopher, Aristotle. Born when Hippocrates was still alive, Aristotle realized, unlike almost everyone before him, that knowledge of nature requires systematic observation. Through careful examination, he recognized an astounding amount of order within the living world, a crucial first step. Aristotle grouped animals into two general categories, those with blood and those without, that correspond closely to the modern classifications of vertebrate and invertebrate. Within the vertebrates he recognized the categories of mammals, birds, and fish. He put most amphibians and reptiles in a single group, and snakes in a separate class. Even though his observations were unaided by instruments, much of Aristotle's reasoning remains sound, despite the knowledge gained in the thousands of years since he died. Only a few significant biological investigators lived during the millennium following Aristotle. One of them was Galen, a 2nd century A.D. physician in Rome. Galen's work shows that careful observation of the outside and, with dissection, the inside of plants and animals, although necessary, is not sufficient to comprehend biology. For example, Galen tried to understand the function of animal organs. Although he knew that the heart pumped blood, he could not tell just from looking that the blood circulated and returned to the heart. Galen mistakenly thought that blood was pumped out to irrigate the tissues, and that new blood was made continuously to resupply the heart. His idea was taught for nearly fifteen hundred years. It was not until the seventeenth century that an Englishman, William Harvey, introduced the theory that blood flows continuously in one direction, making a complete circuit and returning to the heart. Harvey calculated that if the heart pumps out just two ounces of blood per beat, at seventy-two beats per minute, in one hour it would have pumped five hundred forty pounds of blood, triple the weight of a man. Since making that much blood in so short a time is clearly impossible, the blood had to be reused. Harvey's logical reasoning, aided by the still new Arabic numerals which made calculating easy, in support of an unobservable activity, was unprecedented. It set the stage for modern biological thought. In the Middle Ages, the pace of scientific investigation quickened. The examples set by Aristotle had been followed by increasing numbers of naturalists. Many plants were described by the early botanists Brunfels, Bach, Fuchs, and Valerius Cordus. Scientific illustration developed as Rondelet drew animal life in detail. The encyclopedists, such as Conrad Gessner, published large volumes summarizing all of biological knowledge. Linnaeus greatly extended Aristotle's work of classification, inventing the categories of class, order, genus, and species. Studies of comparative biology showed many similarities between diverse branches of life, and the idea of common descent began to be discussed. Biology advanced rapidly in the 17th and 18th centuries as scientists combined Aristotle's and Harvey's examples of attentive observation and clever reasoning. 
yet even the strictest attention and cleverest reasoning will take you only so far if important parts of a system aren't visible. Although the human eye can resolve objects as small as one-tenth of a millimeter, a lot of the action in life occurs on a micro level, a Lilliputian scale. So, biology reached a plateau. One black box, the gross structure of organisms, was opened only to reveal the black box of the finer levels of life. In order to proceed further, biology needed a series of technological breakthroughs. The first was the microscope. Black Boxes Within Black Boxes Lenses were known in ancient times, and by the 15th century their use in spectacles was common. It was not until the 17th century, however, that a convex and a concave lens were put together in a tube to form the first crude microscope. Galileo used one of the first instruments, and he was amazed to discover the compound eyes of insects. Stiludi looked at the eyes, tongue, antennae, and other parts of bees and weevils. Malpighi confirmed the circulation of the blood through capillaries, and he described the early development of the embryonic chick heart. Nehemiah Grew inspected plants, Schwammerdam dissected the mayfly, Leeuwenhoek was the first person ever to see a bacterial cell, and Robert Hooke described cells in cork and leaves, although their importance escaped him. The discovery of an unanticipated Lilliputian world had begun, overturning settled notions of what living things are. Charles Singer, the historian of science, noted that the infinite complexity of living things thus revealed was as philosophically disturbing as the ordered majesty of the astronomical world which Galileo had unveiled to the previous generation, though it took far longer for its implications to sink into men's minds. In other words, sometimes the new boxes demand that we revise all of our theories. In such cases, great unwillingness can arise. The cell theory of life was finally put forward in the early 19th century by Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann. Schleiden worked primarily with plant tissue. He argued for the central importance of a dark spot, the nucleus, within all cells. Schwann concentrated on animal tissue, in which it was harder to see cells. Nonetheless, he discerned that animals were similar to plants in their cellular structure. Schwann concluded that cells, or the secretions of cells, compose the entire bodies of animals and plants, and that in some way the cells are individual units with a life of their own. He wrote that the question as to the fundamental power of organized bodies resolves itself into that of individual cells. As Schleiden added, thus the primary question is, what is the origin of this peculiar little organism, the cell? Schleiden and Schwann worked in the early to middle 1800s, the time of Darwin's travels and the writing of The Origin of Species. To Darwin, then, as to every other scientist of the time, the cell was a black box. Nonetheless, he was able to make sense of much biology above the level of the cell. The idea that life evolves was not original with Darwin, but he argued it by far the most systematically, and the theory of how evolution works, by natural selection working on variation, was his own. Meanwhile, the cellular black box was steadily explored. The investigation of the cell pushed the microscope to its limits, which are set by the wavelength of light. For physical reasons, a microscope cannot resolve two points that are closer together than approximately one-half of the wavelength of the light that is illuminating them. Since the wavelength of visible light is roughly one-tenth the diameter of a bacterial cell, many small critical details of cell structure simply cannot be seen with a light microscope. The black box of the cell could not be opened without further technological improvements. In the late 19th century, as physics progressed rapidly, J. J. Thompson discovered the electron. The invention of the electron microscope followed several decades later. Because the wavelength of the electron is shorter than the wavelength of visible light, much smaller objects can be resolved if they are illuminated with electrons. Electron microscopy has a number of practical difficulties, 
not least of which is the tendency of the electron beam to fry the sample. But ways were found to get around the problems, and after World War II, electron microscopy came into its own. New subcellular structures were discovered, holes were seen in the nucleus, and double membranes detected around mitochondria, a cell's power plants. The same cell that looked so simple under a light microscope now looked much different. The same wonder that the early light microscopists felt when they saw the detailed structure of insects was again felt by 20th century scientists when they saw the complexities of the cell. This level of discovery began to allow biologists to approach the greatest black box of all. The question of how life works was not one that Darwin or his contemporaries could answer. They knew that eyes were for seeing, but how exactly do they see? How does blood clot? How does the body fight disease? The complex structures revealed by the electron microscope were themselves made of smaller components. What were those components? What did they look like? How did they work? The answers to these questions take us out of the realm of biology and into chemistry. They also take us back into the 19th century. The Chemistry of Life As anyone can readily see, living things look different from non-living things. They act different. They feel different, too. Hide and hair can be distinguished easily from rocks and sand. Most people up until the 19th century quite naturally thought that life was made of a special kind of material, one different from the material that composed inanimate objects. But in 1828, Friedrich Wuller heated ammonium cyanate and was amazed to find that urea, a biological waste product, was formed. The synthesis of urea from non-living material shattered the easy distinction between life and non-life, and the inorganic chemist Justus von Liebig then began to study the chemistry of life, or biochemistry. Liebig showed that the body heat of animals is due to the combustion of food. It is not simply an innate property of life. From his successes, he formulated the idea of metabolism, whereby the body builds up and breaks down substances through chemical processes. Ernst Hoppe-Zeiler crystallized the red material from blood, hemoglobin, and showed that it attaches to oxygen in order to carry the latter throughout the body. Emil Fischer demonstrated that the large class of substances called proteins were all constituted from only 20 types of building blocks, called amino acids, joined into chains. What do proteins look like? Although Emil Fischer showed that they were made of amino acids, the details of their structures were unknown. Their size put them below the reach of even electron microscopy, yet it was becoming clear that proteins were the fundamental machines of life, catalyzing the chemistry and building the structures of the cell. A new technique, therefore, was needed to study protein structure. During the first part of the 20th century, X-ray crystallography was used to determine the structures of small molecules. Crystallography involves shining a beam of X-rays onto a crystal of a chemical. The rays scatter by a process called diffraction. If photographic film is placed behind the crystal, then the diffracted X-rays can be detected by examining the exposed film. The pattern of diffraction can, after the application of strenuous mathematics, indicate the position of each and every atom in the molecule. Turning the guns of X-ray crystallography onto proteins would show their structure, but there was a big problem. The more atoms in a molecule, the harder the mathematics, and the harder the task of crystallizing the chemical in the first place. Because proteins have dozens of times more atoms than the molecules typically examined by crystallography, that makes the problem dozens of times more difficult. But some people have dozens of times more perseverance than the rest of us. In 1958, after decades of work, J.C. Kendrew determined the structure of the protein myoglobin using X-ray crystallography. Finally, a technique showed the detailed structure of one of the basic components of life. And what was seen? 
once again more complexity. Before the determination of myoglobin's structure, it was thought that proteins would turn out to be simple and regular structures, like salt crystals. Upon observing the convoluted, complicated, bowel-like structure of myoglobin, however, Max Perutz groaned. Could the search for ultimate truth really have revealed so hideous and visceral-looking an object? Biochemists have since grown to like the intricacies of protein structure. Improvements in computers and other instruments make crystallography a lot easier today than it was for Kendrew, although it still requires substantial effort. As the result of the X-ray work of Kendrew on proteins, and, most famously, Watson and Crick on DNA, for the first time, biochemists actually knew the shapes of the molecules that they were working on. The beginning of modern biochemistry, which has progressed at a breakneck pace since, can be dated to that time. Advances in physics and chemistry, too, have spilled over and created a strong synergism for research on life. Although in theory X-ray crystallography can determine the structure of all the molecules of living things, practical problems limit its use to a relatively small number of proteins and nucleic acids. New techniques, though, have been introduced at a dizzying pace to complement and supplement crystallography. One important technique for determining structure is called nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. With NMR, a molecule can be studied while in solution. It doesn't have to be tediously crystallized. Like X-ray crystallography, NMR can determine the exact structure of proteins and nucleic acids. Also, like crystallography, NMR has limitations that make it usable only with a portion of known proteins. But together, NMR and X-ray crystallography have been able to solve the structures of enough proteins to give scientists a detailed understanding of what they look like. When Leeuwenhoek used a microscope to see a tinier mite on a tiny flea, it inspired Jonathan Swift to write a ditty anticipating an endless procession of smaller and smaller bugs. So naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. Swift was wrong. The procession does not go on forever. In the late twentieth century, we are in the flood tide of research on life, and the end is in sight. The last remaining black box was the cell, which was opened to reveal molecules, the bedrock of nature. Lower we cannot go. Moreover, the work that has already been done on enzymes, other proteins, and nucleic acids has illuminated the principles at work at the ground level of life. Many details remain to be filled in, and some surprises undoubtedly remain, but unlike earlier scientists, who looked at a fish or a heart or a cell and wondered what it was and what made it work, modern scientists are satisfied that the actions of proteins and other molecules are sufficient explanations for the basis of life. From Aristotle to modern biochemistry, one layer after another has been peeled away, until the cell, Darwin's black box, stands open. Little Jumps, Big Jumps Suppose a four-foot-wide ditch in your backyard, running to the horizon in both directions, separates your property from that of your neighbor's. If one day you met him in your yard and asked how he got there, you would have no reason to doubt the answer. I jumped over the ditch. If the ditch were eight feet wide and he gave the same answer, you would be impressed with his athletic ability. If the ditch were fifteen feet wide, you might become suspicious and ask him to jump again while you watched. If he declined, pleading a sprained knee, you would harbor your doubts, but wouldn't be certain that he was just telling a tale. If the ditch were actually a canyon one hundred feet wide, however, you would not entertain for a moment the bold assertion that he jumped across. But suppose your neighbor, a clever man, qualifies his claim. He did not come across in one jump. Rather, he says, in the canyon there were a number of buttes, no more than ten feet apart from one another. 
He jumped from one narrowly spaced butte to another to reach your side. Glancing toward the canyon, you tell your neighbor that you see no buttes, just a wide chasm separating your yard from his. He agrees, but explains that it took him years and years to come over. During that time, buttes occasionally arose in the chasm, and he progressed as they popped up. After he left a butte, it usually eroded pretty quickly and crumbled back into the canyon. Very dubious, but with no easy way to prove him wrong, you change the subject to baseball. This little story teaches several lessons. First, the word jump can be offered as an explanation of how someone crossed a barrier, but the explanation can range from completely convincing to totally inadequate depending on details, such as how wide the barrier is. Second, long journeys can be made much more plausible if they are explained as a series of smaller jumps rather than one great leap. And third, in the absence of evidence of such smaller jumps, it is very difficult to prove right or wrong someone who asserts that stepping stones existed in the past but have disappeared. Of course, the allegory of jumps across narrow ditches versus canyons can be applied to evolution. The word evolution has been invoked to explain tiny changes in organisms as well as huge changes. These are often given separate names. Roughly speaking, microevolution describes changes that can be made in one or a few small jumps, whereas macroevolution describes changes that appear to require large jumps. The proposal by Darwin that even relatively tiny changes could occur in nature was a great conceptual advance. The observation of such changes was a hugely gratifying confirmation of his intuition. Darwin saw similar but not identical species of finches on the various Galapagos islands and theorized that they descended from a common ancestor. Recently, some scientists from Princeton actually observed the average beak size of finch populations changing over the course of a few years. Earlier, it was shown that the numbers of dark versus light-colored moths in a population changed as the environment went from sooty to clean. Similarly, birds introduced into North America by European settlers have diversified into several distinct groups. In recent decades, it has been possible to gain evidence for microevolution on a molecular scale. For instance, viruses, such as the one that causes AIDS, mutate their coats in order to evade the human immune system. Disease-causing bacteria have made a comeback as strains evolved the ability to defend against antibiotics. Many other examples could be cited. On a small scale, Darwin's theory has triumphed, it is now about as controversial as an athlete's assertion that he or she could jump over a four-foot ditch. But it is at the level of macroevolution, of large jumps, that the theory evokes skepticism. Many people have followed Darwin in proposing that huge changes can be broken down into plausible small steps over great periods of time. Persuasive evidence to support that position, however, has not been forthcoming. Nonetheless, like a neighbor's story about vanishing buttes, it has been difficult to evaluate whether the elusive and ill-defined small steps could exist. Until now. With the advent of modern biochemistry, we are now able to look at the rock-bottom level of life. We can now make an informed evaluation of whether the putative small steps required to produce large evolutionary changes can ever get small enough. You will see in this book that the canyons separating everyday life forms have their counterparts in the canyons that separate biological systems on a microscopic scale. Like a fractal pattern in mathematics, where a motif is repeated even as you look at smaller and smaller scales, unbridgeable chasms occur even at the tiniest level of life. A Series of Eyes Biochemistry has pushed Darwin's theory to the limit. It has done so by opening the ultimate black box, the cell, thereby making possible our understanding of how life works. It is the astonishing complexity of subcellular organic structures that has forced the question. How could all this have evolved? 
to feel the brunt of the question, and to get a taste of what's in store for us, let's look at an example of a biochemical system. An explanation for the origin of a function must keep pace with contemporary science. Let's explore how science's explanation for one function, vision, has progressed since the 19th century, then ask how that affects our task of explaining its origin. In the 19th century, the anatomy of the eye was known in detail. The pupil of the eye, scientists knew, acts as a shutter to let in enough light to see in either brilliant sunlight or nighttime darkness. The lens of the eye gathers light and focuses it on the retina to form a sharp image. The muscles of the eye allow it to move quickly. Different colors of light with different wavelengths would cause a blurred image, except that the lens of the eye changes density over its surface to correct for chromatic aberration. These sophisticated methods astounded everyone who was familiar with them. Scientists of the 19th century knew that if a person lacked any of the eye's many integrated features, the result would be a severe loss of vision or outright blindness. They concluded that the eye could function only if it were nearly intact. Charles Darwin knew about the eye, too. In The Origin of Species, Darwin dealt with many objections to his theory of evolution by natural selection. He discussed the problem of the eye in a section of the book appropriately entitled Organs of Extreme Perfection and Complication. In Darwin's thinking, evolution could not build a complex organ in one step or a few steps, Radical innovations such as the eye would require generations of organisms to slowly accumulate beneficial changes in a gradual process. He realized that if in one generation an organ as complex as the eye suddenly appeared, it would be tantamount to a miracle. Unfortunately, gradual development of the human eye appeared to be impossible, since its many sophisticated features seemed to be interdependent, Somehow, for evolution to be believable, Darwin had to convince the public that complex organs could be formed in a step-by-step -step process. He succeeded brilliantly. Cleverly, Darwin didn't try to discover a real pathway that evolution might have used to make the eye. Rather, he pointed to modern animals with different kinds of eyes, ranging from the simple to the complex, and suggested that the evolution of the human eye might have involved similar organs as intermediates. Here is a paraphrase of Darwin's argument. Although humans have complex camera-type eyes, many animals get by with less. Some tiny creatures have just a simple group of pigmented cells, not much more than a light-sensitive spot. That simple arrangement can hardly be said to confer vision, but it can sense light and dark, and so it meets the creature's needs. The light-sensing organ of some starfishes is somewhat more sophisticated. Their eye is located in a depressed region. Since the curvature of the depression blocks off light from some directions, the animal can sense which direction the light is coming from. The directional sense of the eye improves if the curvature becomes more pronounced, but more curvature also lessens the amount of light that enters the eye, decreasing its sensitivity. The sensitivity can be increased by placement of gelatinous material in the cavity to act as a lens. Some modern animals have eyes with such crude lenses. Gradual improvements in the lens could then provide increasingly sharp images to meet the requirements of the animal's environment. Using reasoning like this, Darwin convinced many of his readers that an evolutionary pathway leads from the simplest light-sensitive spot to the sophisticated camera eye of man. But the question of how vision began remained unanswered. Darwin persuaded much of the world that a modern eye evolved gradually from a simpler structure, but he did not even try to explain where his starting point, the relatively simple light-sensitive spot, came from. On the contrary, Darwin dismissed the question of the eye's ultimate origin. How a nerve comes to be sensitive to light hardly concerns us more than how life itself originated. He had an excellent reason for declining the question. 
It was completely beyond 19th century science. How the eye works, that is, what happens when a photon of light first hits the retina, simply could not be answered at that time. As a matter of fact, no question about the underlying mechanisms of life could be answered. How did animal muscles cause movement? How did photosynthesis work? How was energy extracted from food? How did the body fight infection? No one knew. The Vision of Biochemistry To Darwin, vision was a black box, but after the cumulative hard work of many biochemists, we are now approaching answers to the question of sight. The following five paragraphs give a biochemical sketch of the eye's operation. Don't be put off by the strange names of the components. They're just labels, no more esoteric than carburetor or differential are to someone reading a car manual for the first time. Listeners with an appetite for detail can find more information in many biochemistry textbooks. Others may wish to tread lightly. When light first strikes the retina, a photon interacts with a molecule called 11 cis retinal, which rearranges within picoseconds to trans retinal. A picosecond is about the time it takes light to travel the breadth of a single human hair. The change in the shape of the retinal molecule forces a change in the shape of the protein, rhodopsin, to which the retinal is tightly bound. The protein's metamorphosis alters its behavior. Now called metarhodopsin II, the protein sticks to another protein, called transducin. Before bumping into metarhodopsin II, transducin had tightly bound a small molecule called GDP. But when transducin interacts with metarhodopsin II, the GDP falls off, and a molecule called GTP binds to transducin. GTP is closely related to, but critically different from GDP. GTP transducin metarhodopsin II now binds to a protein called phosphodiesterase, located in the inner membrane of the cell. When attached to metarhodopsin II and its entourage, the phosphodiesterase acquires the chemical ability to cut a molecule called CGMP, a chemical relative of both GDP and GTP, Initially, there are a lot of CGMP molecules in the cell, but the phosphodiesterase lowers its concentration, just as a pulled plug lowers the water level in a bathtub. Another membrane protein that binds CGMP is called an ion channel. It acts as a gateway that regulates the number of sodium ions in the cell. Normally, the ion channel allows sodium ions to flow into the cell, while a separate protein actively pumps them out again. The dual action of the ion channel and pump keeps the level of sodium ions in the cell within a narrow range. When the amount of CGMP is reduced because of cleavage by the phosphodiesterase, the ion channel closes, causing the cellular concentration of positively charged sodium ions to be reduced. This causes an imbalance of charge across the cell membrane that, finally, causes a current to be transmitted down the optic nerve to the brain. The result, when interpreted by the brain, is vision. If the reactions mentioned previously were the only ones that operated in the cell, the supply of 11 cis retinal CGMP and sodium ions would quickly be depleted. Something has to turn off the proteins that were turned on and restore the cell to its original state. Several mechanisms do this. First, in the dark, the ion channel, in addition to sodium ions, also lets calcium ions into the cell. The calcium is pumped back out by a different protein so that a constant calcium concentration is maintained. When CGMP levels fall, shutting down the ion channel, calcium ion concentration decreases too. The phosphodiesterase enzyme, which destroys CGMP, slows down at lower calcium concentration. Second, a protein called guanylate cyclase begins to resynthesize CGMP when calcium levels start to fall. Third, while all of this is going on, metarhodopsin II is chemically modified by an enzyme called rhodopsin kinase, 
The modified rhodopsin then binds to a protein known as arrestin, which prevents the rhodopsin from activating more transducin. So the cell contains mechanisms to limit the amplified signal started by a single photon. Transretinal eventually falls off of rhodopsin and must be reconverted to 11 cisretinal and again bound by rhodopsin to get back to the starting point for another visual cycle. To accomplish this, transretinal is first chemically modified by an enzyme to transretinol, a form containing two more hydrogen atoms. A second enzyme then converts the molecule to 11 cisretinol. Finally, a third enzyme removes the previously added hydrogen atoms to form 11 cisretinol. A cycle is complete. The previous explanation is just a sketchy overview of the biochemistry of vision. Ultimately, though, this is the level of explanation for which biological science must aim. In order to truly understand a function, one must understand in detail every relevant step in the process. The relevant steps in biological processes occur ultimately at the molecular level, so a satisfactory explanation of a biological phenomenon, such as sight, digestion, or immunity, must include its molecular explanation. Now that the black box of vision has been opened, it is no longer enough for an evolutionary explanation of that power to consider only the anatomical structures of whole eyes, as Darwin did in the 19th century, and as popularizers of evolution continue to do today. Each of the anatomical steps and structures that Darwin thought were so simple actually involves staggeringly complicated biochemical processes that cannot be papered over with rhetoric. Darwin's metaphorical hops from butte to butte are now revealed in many cases to be huge leaps between carefully tailored machines, distances that would require a helicopter to cross in one trip. Thus, biochemistry offers a Lilliputian challenge to Darwin. Anatomy is, quite simply, irrelevant to the question of whether evolution could take place on the molecular level. So is the fossil record. It no longer matters whether there are huge gaps in the fossil record or whether the record is as continuous as that of U.S. presidents. And if there are gaps, it does not matter whether they can be explained plausibly. The fossil record has nothing to tell us about whether the interactions of 11 cis-retinal with rhodopsin, transducin, and phosphodiesterase could have developed step by step. Neither do the patterns of biogeography matter, nor those of population biology, nor the traditional explanations of evolutionary theory for rudimentary organs or species abundance. This is not to say that random mutation is a myth, or that Darwinism fails to explain anything, it explains microevolution very nicely, or that large-scale phenomena like population genetics don't matter. They do. Until recently, however, evolutionary biologists could be unconcerned with the molecular details of life because so little was known about them. Now the black box of the cell has been opened, and the infinitesimal world that stands revealed must be explained. Calvinism It seems to be characteristic of the human mind that when it sees a black box in action, it imagines that the contents of the box are simple. A happy example is seen in the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin is always jumping in a box with his stuffed tiger Hobbes and traveling back in time or transmogrifying himself into animal shapes or using it as a duplicator and making clones of himself. A little boy like Calvin easily imagines that a box can fly like an airplane or something because Calvin doesn't know how airplanes work. In some ways, grown-up scientists are just as prone to wishful thinking as little boys like Calvin for example, centuries ago it was thought that insects and other small animals arose directly from spoiled food. This was easy to believe because small animals were thought to be very simple. Before the invention of the microscope, naturalists thought that insects had no internal organs. But as biology progressed and careful experiments showed that protected food did not breed life, 
The theory of spontaneous generation retreated to the limits beyond which science could not detect what was really happening. In the 19th century, that meant the cell, when beer, milk, or urine were allowed to sit for several days in containers, even closed ones, they always became cloudy from something growing in them. The microscopes of the 18th and 19th centuries showed that the growth was very small, apparently living cells, so it seemed reasonable that simple living organisms could arise spontaneously from liquids. The key to persuading people was the portrayal of the cells as simple. One of the chief advocates of the theory of spontaneous generation during the middle of the 19th century was Ernst Haeckel, a great admirer of Darwin and an eager popularizer of Darwin's theory. From the limited view of cells that microscopes provided, Haeckel believed that a cell was a simple little lump of albuminous combination of carbon, not much different from a piece of microscopic jello. So it seemed to Heckel that such simple life, with no internal organs, could be produced easily from inanimate material. Now, of course, we know better. Here is a simple analogy. Darwin is to our understanding of the origin of vision as Heckel is to our understanding of the origin of life. In both cases, brilliant 19th-century scientists tried to explain Lilliputian biology that was hidden from them, and both did so by assuming that the inside of the black box must be simple. Time has proven them wrong. In the first half of the 20th century, the many branches of biology did not often communicate with each other. As a result, genetics, systematics, paleontology, comparative anatomy, embryology, and other areas developed their own views of what evolution meant. Inevitably, evolutionary theory began to mean different things to different disciplines. A coherent view of Darwinian evolution was being lost. In the middle of the century, however, leaders of the fields organized a series of interdisciplinary meetings to combine their views into a coherent theory of evolution based on Darwinian principles. The result has been called the evolutionary synthesis and the theory called neo-Darwinism. Neo-Darwinism is the basis of modern evolutionary thought. One branch of science was not invited to the meetings, and for good reason— it did not yet exist. The beginnings of modern biochemistry came only after neo-Darwinism had been officially launched. Thus, just as biology had to be reinterpreted after the complexity of microscopic life was discovered, neo-Darwinism must be reconsidered in light of advances in biochemistry. The scientific disciplines that were part of the evolutionary synthesis are all non-molecular, Yet for the Darwinian theory of evolution to be true, it has to account for the molecular structure of life. It is the purpose of this book to reveal that it does not. Chapter 2. Nuts and Bolts The Natives Are Restless Lynn Margulis is Distinguished University Professor of Biology at the University of Massachusetts. Lynn Margulis is highly respected for her widely accepted theory that mitochondria, the energy source of plant and animal cells, were once independent bacterial cells. And Lynn Margulis says that history will ultimately judge neo-Darwinism as a minor 20th century religious sect within the sprawling religious persuasion of Anglo-Saxon biology. At one of her many public talks, she asks the molecular biologists in the audience to name a single, unambiguous example of the formation of a new species by the accumulation of mutations. Her challenge goes unmet. Proponents of the standard theory, she says, wallow in their zoological, capitalistic, competitive, cost-benefit interpretation of Darwin, having mistaken him. Neo-Darwinism, which insists on the slow accrual of mutations, is in a complete funk. Juicy quotes these, and she is not alone in her unhappiness. Over the past 130 years, Darwinism, although securely entrenched, has met a steady stream of dissent, both from within the scientific community and from without it. 
In the 1940s, the geneticist Richard Goldschmidt became so disenchanted with Darwinism's explanation for the origins of new structures that he was driven to propose the hopeful monster theory. Goldschmidt thought that occasionally large changes might occur just by chance. Perhaps a reptile laid an egg once, say, and from it hatched a bird. The hopeful monster theory didn't catch on, but dissatisfaction with a Darwinian interpretation of the fossil record bubbled up several decades later. Paleontologist Niles Eldridge describes the problem. No wonder paleontologists shied away from evolution for so long. It never seems to happen. Assiduous collecting up cliff faces yields zigzags, minor oscillations, and the very occasional slight accumulation of change— over millions of years, at a rate too slow to account for all the prodigious change that has occurred in evolutionary history. When we do see the introduction of evolutionary novelty, it usually shows up with a bang, and often with no firm evidence that the fossils did not evolve elsewhere. Evolution cannot forever be going on somewhere else. Yet that's how the fossil record has struck many a forlorn paleontologist looking to learn something about evolution. To try to alleviate the dilemma, in the early 1970s, Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould proposed a theory they called punctuated equilibrium. The theory postulates two things, that for long periods most species undergo little observable change, and that when it does occur, change is rapid and concentrated in small isolated populations. If this happened, then fossil intermediates would be hard to find, squaring with the spotty fossil record. Like Goldschmidt, Eldridge and Gould believe in common descent, but think that a mechanism other than natural selection is needed to explain rapid large-scale changes. Gould has been at the forefront of the discussion of another fascinating phenomenon, the Cambrian explosion. Careful searches show only a smattering of fossils of multicellular creatures in rocks older than about 600 million years. Yet in rocks, just a little bit younger, is seen a profusion of fossilized animals, with a host of widely differing body plans. Recently, the estimated time over which the explosion took place has been revised downward from 50 million years to 10 million years, a blink of the eye in geological terms. The shorter time estimate has forced headline writers to grope for new superlatives, a favorite being the biological Big Bang. Gould has argued that the rapid rate of appearance of new life forms demands a mechanism other than natural selection for its explanation. Ironically, we have come full circle from Darwin's day. When Darwin first proposed his theory, a big difficulty was the estimated age of the Earth— 19th-century physicists thought the Earth was only about a hundred million years old, yet Darwin thought natural selection would require much more time to produce life. At first, he was proven right. The Earth is now known to be much older. With the discovery of the biological Big Bang, however, the window of time for life to go from simple to complex has shrunk to much less than 19th-century estimates of the Earth's age. It is not just paleontologists looking for bones, though, who are disgruntled. A raft of evolutionary biologists examining whole organisms wonder just how Darwinism can account for their observations. The English biologists Maywon Ho and Peter Saunders complain as follows. It is now approximately half a century since the neo-Darwinian synthesis was formulated. A great deal of research has been carried on within the paradigm it defines— Yet the successes of the theory are limited to the minutiae of evolution, such as the adaptive change in coloration of moths, while it has remarkably little to say on the questions which interest us most, such as how there came to be moths in the first place. University of Georgia geneticist John MacDonald notes a conundrum. The results of the last twenty years of research on the genetic basis of adaptation has led us to a great Darwinian paradox. Those genes that are obviously variable within natural populations do not seem to lie at the basis of many major adaptive changes, while those genes that seemingly do constitute the foundation of many, if not most, major adaptive changes 
apparently are not variable within natural populations. Australian evolutionary geneticist George Miklos puzzles over the usefulness of Darwinism. What then does this all-encompassing theory of evolution predict? Given a handful of postulates, such as random mutations and selection coefficients, it will predict changes in gene frequencies over time. Is this what a grand theory of evolution ought to be about? Jerry Coyne, of the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago, arrives at an unanticipated verdict. We conclude, unexpectedly, that there is little evidence for the neo-Darwinian view. Its theoretical foundations and the experimental evidence supporting it are weak. And University of California geneticist John Endler ponders how beneficial mutations arise. Although much is known about mutation, it is still largely a black box relative to evolution. Novel biochemical functions seem to be rare in evolution, and the basis for their origin is virtually unknown. Mathematicians over the years have complained that Darwinism's numbers just do not add up. Information theorist Hubert Yockey argues that the information needed to begin life could not have developed by chance. He suggests that life be considered a given, like matter or energy. In 1966, leading mathematicians and evolutionary biologists held a symposium at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia because the organizer, Martin Kaplan, had overheard a rather weird discussion between four mathematicians on mathematical doubts concerning the Darwinian theory of evolution. At the symposium, one side was unhappy and the other was uncomprehending. A mathematician who claimed that there was insufficient time for the number of mutations apparently needed to make an eye was told by the biologists that his figures must be wrong. The mathematicians, though, were not persuaded that the fault was theirs. As one said, there is a considerable gap in the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, and we believe this gap to be of such a nature that it cannot be bridged with the current conception of biology. Stuart Kaufman of the Santa Fe Institute is a leading proponent of complexity theory. Simply put, it proposes that many features of living systems are the result of self-organization, the tendency of complex systems to arrange themselves in patterns, and not natural selection. Darwin and evolution stand astride us, whatever the mutterings of creation scientists. But is the view right? Better, is it adequate? I believe it is not. It is not that Darwin is wrong, but that he got hold of only part of the truth. Complexity theory has so far attracted few followers, but much criticism. John Maynard Smith, under whom Kaufman did graduate work, complains that the theory is too mathematical and is unconnected to real-life chemistry. Although the complaint has merit, Smith offers no solution to the problem which Kaufman identified, the origin of complex systems. All told, Darwin's theory has generated dissent from the time it was published, and not just for theological reasons. In 1871, one of Darwin's critics, St. George Mivart, listed his objections to the theory, many of which are surprisingly similar to those raised by modern critics. What is to be brought forward against Darwinism may be summed up as follows, that natural selection is incompetent to account for the incipient stages of useful structures, that it does not harmonize with the coexistence of closely similar structures of diverse origin, that there are grounds for thinking that specific differences may be developed suddenly instead of gradually, that the opinion that species have definite, though very different, limits to their variability is still tenable, that certain fossil transitional forms are absent, which might have been expected to be present, that there are many remarkable phenomena in organic forms upon which natural selection throws no light whatever. It seems, then, that the same argument has gone on without resolution for over a century. From Mivart to Margulis, there have always been well-informed, respected scientists who have found Darwinism to be inadequate. 
Apparently, either the questions first raised by Mavart have gone unanswered, or some people have not been satisfied by the answers they received. Before going further, we should note the obvious. If a poll were taken of all the scientists in the world, the great majority would say they believed Darwinism to be true. But scientists, like everybody else, based most of their opinions on the word of other people. Of the great majority who accept Darwinism, most, though not all, do so based on authority. Also, and unfortunately, too often criticisms have been dismissed by the scientific community for fear of giving ammunition to creationists. It is ironic that in the name of protecting science, trenchant scientific criticism of natural selection has been brushed aside. It is time to put the debate squarely in the open and to disregard public relations problems. The time for the debate is now because at last we have reached the bottom of biology, and a resolution is possible. At the tiniest levels of biology, the chemical life of the cell, we have discovered a complex world that radically changes the grounds on which Darwinian debates must be contested. Consider, for example, what a biochemical view does to the creationist-Darwinist debate about the bombardier beetle. Beetle Bombs The bombardier beetle is an insect of unassuming appearance, measuring about one-half inch in length. When it is threatened by another bug, however, the beetle has a special method of defending itself, squirting a boiling hot solution at the enemy out of an aperture in its hind section. The heated liquid scalds its target, which then usually makes other plans for dinner. How is this trick done? It turns out that the bombardier beetle is using chemistry. Prior to battle, specialized structures called secretory lobes make a very concentrated mixture of two chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. The hydrogen peroxide is the same material as one can buy in a drugstore. Hydroquinone is used in photographic development. The mixture. We hope you enjoyed this preview. To continue listening to this audiobook on Google Play Books, use the link in the video description.